Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is History Lecture 29, Decolonizing Art History. First, I'm going to talk about five different strategies that have appeared in the recent literature for ways to decolonize art history. And then I'm going to propose that there's an historical development in interest in decolonization from a kind of pure activism to a theory, to a resource uh, that can be used to interpret art. So first, what does it mean to decolonize art history? In the past 10 or so years, and especially since the events of 2019 and 2020 and the developments in Black Lives Matter, there have been an increasing number of calls to uh, investigate the systemic racism of arts institutions. And yet still there's no consensus on how to understand what it might mean to decolonize a discipline as opposed to decolonizing a country, a political entity, or a culture. So in this talk, I'm going to start with five interpretations of the call to decolonize art history and then talk about the relation between activist and theoretical understandings of decolonization. In 2019, the English journal Art History issued a questionnaire on decolonizing art history. It was published the next year with its images. Uh, that's the cover of, the, of that issue. Uh, by the Nigerian architect and painter Abe Odedina. There are about 30 responses, and to me they suggest about five different strategies to understand the phrase decolonize art history. And I've arranged these in approximate order from practical teaching strategies that are common in the discipline to calls that would effectively uh, end a discipline that could be called art history. The first strategy would be teaching art as race, ethnicity, class, or power, or for race, ethnicity, class, or power. In other words, not teaching for masterpieces or for aesthetic values, but teach in order to talk about race, ethnicity, class, and power. Several of the respondents to the survey said that decolonizing means focusing on these issues in the interpretation of art. Old master painting and the notions of history and culture, according to one of the respondents, Jill Burke, are used to justify covertly and even overtly structures of inequality that have a real effect on people's life chances. She compares Leonardo's Salvator Mundi, a painting that was sold for $450 million in 2017, to the murder the next year of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and she asks if the one, quote, makes up for the other. In this understanding, decolonizing art history involves teaching modern art through histories of colonialism and decolonization. Art would no longer be introduced as it conventionally has been using older methods of interpretation like iconography, style analysis, or formal analysis because their implication in ideas of history and culture would make them sus suspect or complicit. Art history would fundamentally shift toward an exploration of racism, colonialism, and related issues. This is probably the most common strategy that's currently used in the teaching of the history of art. A second strategy advocated by several of the respondents to the art history questionnaire is to increase diversity at the center of the discipline. In Tim Barringer's words, a key to moving ahead is to diversify the voices at the heart of the discipline. A plurality of voices, including indigenous people, must occupy the center ground of art history. Notice here the metaphors heart and center ground because strategies like this involve further questions of what comprises the center of the discipline. Is it a canon? Is it the masterpieces or the artworks themselves? A set of cultures and narratives, values, models of interest? Is it exemplary scholarly practices? And so on. Barringer's uh, reworking of the Global Art History Survey at Yale was very widely publicized um, as destroying or ending art history um, in, popular, in popular reception. Um, his course added new thematically oriented courses, optional courses, with titles like Art and Politics, Global Craft, and The Silk Road. Now, this is actually a strategy that art history had been trying out since the 1980s. So it's been around for 40, almost 50 years. In plans like this, 
often the quote-unquote heart, whatever the comprises the master narrative or the Eurocentric narrative, or the core narrative from which um, we departed in our interest in diversity, often survives. Um, it survives as a module among others. Um, so the criticism of the heart, as it were, of art history um, is often deferred. Other respondents talked about taking things out of the center rather than adding things to it or multiplying it. So Priyanka Basu, who teaches at University of Minnesota at Morris, said undertaking all this involves jettisoning or marginalizing some content that was taught by my department and thought of as essential. In this version of the strategy, you push some subjects to the sides of the discipline or you omit them entirely. Uh, these responses, of course, are short and so there aren't, there aren't syllabi, there aren't specific um, suggestions. Um, but that's the general tendency in the discipline is to marginalize, sideline, minimalize, shrink, divide, um, move, whatever is thought of as having comprised uh, the center of the central narratives at the heart of the discipline. A third strategy would be to remove the center completely. So James D'Amelio, who teaches at University of South Florida, said in his response, rather than reshuffling canons, shouldn't we reject them as inherently exclusionary? Rather than globalizing the Middle Ages, his specialty, shouldn't we abandon developmental models and judgments behind periodizations? The idea here would be to remove some artworks and cultures from the canons, from the syllabi, and also remove developmental models, which ultimately then derive from narratives in texts like Vasari, Winkelmann, Hegel, and others um, who are um, predecessors of contemporary art historical practice. D'Amelio also questions efforts to make cultures, to remake cultures, quote, as more racially diverse than perhaps they were. Better to sever them from modern constructions and uses of race. We may provincialize Europe by studying these periods cross-culturally with methodologies from outside Western art history. The suggestion here is that we should replace what's been removed from the center of art history with studies of, quote, power and marginality, centers and peripheries, cultural exchange and appropriation, and competing claims to tradition from other disciplines. Questions like this about center and periphery have also been developed by art historians like uh, Thomas da Costa Kaufmann in an edited volume called Circulations and a Global Art History Textbook. Um, so these, these kinds of experiments have also been done, maybe less frequently than the emphasis on race and class and power that was my first category. The last two of the five that I want to talk about um, have not been done in any systematic way. The fourth one would be to dismantle the discipline itself. So for Kadri Jane, who's done a lot of work in visual studies as well as art history, decolonizing, quote, takes us well beyond art history as we know it into an emergent domain of practice whose forms cannot be predicted in an avant-gardist theoretical mode. If in these processes something recognizable remains of art history, my hunch is that it will be our close attention to the work of the senses. These calls for dismantling disciplines um, don't usually picture what might emerge, and part of the interest of them is that, that what will come out will be unpredictable. Uh, one of the respondents, Susan Pui San Locke, describes her idea of dismantled art history as, quote, decentered, deterritorialized, de disciplined, heterogeneous, contested, contradictory, confused, confusing, multiple, multitudinous, multilingual translingual, untranslatable, diasporic, migratory, translocal, transhemispheric, oceanic, archipelagic, uncertain, indefinite, unstable, transforming, transformative. For other respondents, the dismantling of the discipline is primarily a question of institutional politics. So here's Simon Soon from University of Malaya. My frustration comes principally from some well-meaning mentors and colleagues in established universities in first world countries who ultimately suggest that if I show any promise of being recognized in the field as an art historian, this can only be achieved on the condition that my academic labor produce measurable outputs that have already been decided by the mechanism of global academia, funding structures, publications, links with industry and forms of accounting. In the questionnaire, these are two different kinds of calls for dismantling the discipline. Those who would want to apply critical tools of post-structuralism 
and those who are more interested in the discipline and the politics and the institution and the flows of money and careers and all the rest of that everyday concerns. They may only be related by the shared rhetoric of the deconstruction of the discipline, but I put them together in this um, because of the selection in the art history questionnaire. So in this way of numbering, the most radical of the options would be to try to remove the inheritance of the Enlightenment upon which art history was built. One of the most articulate responses along those lines is Josh Elsner's. He says, Every reflex, assumption, starting point, from methods to concepts, is inherently Eurocentric, which means, when applied outside or beyond the European tradition, colonialist or worse. The starting point of a decolonized art history is the conversation that begins with categories that are not our own. The challenge would be then to begin again from concepts that were not familiar to us from the Enlightenment. The issue, he says, is not changing the topics of our attention, that's easy. It is that the discipline of art history as conducted worldwide today is fundamentally Eurocentric, founded on post-Christian Enlightenment axioms of thought and critical assumptions, grounded in a long ancestralist meditation on the nature of images that reaches back to classical antiquity. In modernity, this body of reflections was welded onto a modern scholarly discipline and came to maturity in the great critical projects of the later 19th and 20th centuries associated with names like Regal, Verflin, and Panofsky, people who are predecessors and models uh, for conventional art history. This position is broadly compatible with several other respondents who only offer local responses, so just to give a sampling of those. Parul Mukherjee notes the westernness of the concept of formalism. That's an interpretive strategy which is widely used to interpret the world's art regardless of period or style. And there's another of these lectures on that topic. Jennifer Nelson, who works in Madison, Wisconsin, notes that art history uses art as evidence, making it hard to conceive of, quote, moments of imminence and contingency. And Griselda Pollock asks instructors to ask, quote, what universal words have I used? that are not at all universals. For another respondent, Kamini Velodi, quote, the decolonization of art history must proceed as a reassessment and critique of the epistemological, rational, and representational thinking that marks art history's scholarly debt to its 18th and 19th century European roots. That's also compatible with Josh Elsner's uh, position but Velodi is also interested in using post-structuralist tools to accomplish that. She argues for, quote, affirming continuity with post-structuralist philosophies of difference, undermining the universals, binaries, and essentialism associated with the imperialist image of Western thought. Just a couple of examples that are not on the questionnaire. Caroline Ferreira is a Brazilian scholar uh, who's written this book applying decolonial perspectives to the last 2,500 years of art history. She describes, quote, the history of art as an epistemology that has tried to defend Europe's superiority over the centuries, requiring an approach to decoloniality that is more historiographic than the political stance of postcolonial theory. And I'll come back to this question of historiography at the end. And another example of a writer who was not included in the art history questionnaire, uh, Madina Plostanova is a Circassian Tatar Uzbek scholar who's interested in decolonizing being, sensing, gender, and knowledge, and she works on decolonial aesthetics. So just as, just as samples of the wider field. So to recap the five principal strategies, first teaching art as race or for race, ethnicity, class, power, and other issues. Second, Increasing diversity at the center of the discipline, dividing the discipline, decentering the center. Three, removing the center of the discipline entirely. Four, dismantling art history as a discipline. And five, trying to remove the inheritance of the Enlightenment. The first two are works in progress in a number of art history departments worldwide. The third and the fourth have happened in some universities, um, especially ones that have turned more to visual culture and other subjects. The fifth one hasn't been tried. It seems to me for various reasons to be the most interesting one. And some of this material is also in that uh, book of mine that's on the right of the screen there.
these are all open questions um, and it's also an open question about what kind of art history we would want to preserve and why. So on to the second half of this uh, talk and that is about a movement that I think can be traced uh, in the idea of decolonizing art history from an activism to a more theoretical stance. The editors of the Art History Questionnaire, Catherine Grant and Dorothy Price, wonder in their introduction if the current calls for decolonization are, quote, different from previous challenges to the discipline, such as post-colonialism, feminism, queer studies, and Marxism. And their implicit answer, of course, is yes, because decolonial initiatives have the goal of institutional restructuring. They mention the unrest in South Africa beginning in 2015 as the inception of a growing awareness that, quote, unspoken colonial legacies had for too long upheld and promulgated white privilege. There's an increasing sense of art history being an embattled discipline, they say, an unnecessary luxury for many students faced with tens of thousands of pounds of student debt. So if the events in South Africa are to be the model for decolonizing art history, then the decolonial is not the same as post-colonial theory of feminism or other challenges to the discipline. However, decolonization in art history might follow a sequence that's also been followed by post-colonial theory, feminism, and other such challenges, and that's a, challenges are a recurring phenomenon in art history since the 70s. That is, decolonization might be gradually absorbed into the repertoire of the discipline, and used as an interpretive strategy. Those are some examples of texts along the spectrum uh, that I want to follow. Psychoanalysis is a potential historical parallel because it began as a clinical practice. Freud did write several things on artworks, but it was basically a practical clinical practice. But by the 1970s, it had developed into one of several post-structural, mainly French-inflected theories that were used for interpreting art. I think there might be three separable moments in this change from activist strategy to interpretive method. First, decolonization as epistemic disobedience. Second, as incremental change. And then third, as interpretive strategy. So I'll give a few examples of each one of those. First of all, decolonization as epistemic disobedience. This is Walter Mignolo's expression entailing divestiture and deconstruction of the colonial heritage. And it potentially involves institutions that have supported art history, but it's generally speaking, it's a political construction. An activist decolonial movement faces very different challenges in other parts of the world. In South Africa, for example, proportional representation in art history would involve hiring black African faculty up to 75% of total faculty and in some cases reducing white African representation to less than 10% in order to reflect the country's demographics. A consistent application of epistemic disobedience in Mignolo's sense in South Africa would also entail decommissioning the universities themselves because they're indebted to UK models. But without the institutional models that were inherited mainly from the UK, including programs in art history, conferences, journals, and so on, then it's not clear what will remain to be called art history. And this isn't, by the way, an argument to save some form of art history, uh, just an observation about the open-ended nature of the activist understanding of decolonizing art history. Grant and Price's interest in activism is compatible with a well-known essay by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor from 2012 which is a criticism of the, quote, ease with which the language of decolonization has been superficially adopted into education and other social sciences. In their view, decolonization, and they're not talking about art history specifically, quote, brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life and should not be, quote, punctuated by metaphor. That's a really nice expression because it almost sounds like punctured by metaphor or available for easy adoption in academic discourse. In this sense, decolonizing art history could be thought of as a category error. A second stage in this change would be decolonization understood as incremental activism, incremental intervention. 
in the Americas and Europe, especially, decolonial theory is often spoken of as a matter of things that happen in the art world, especially individual artists' installations, um, exhibitions, performances, texts, different acts of curation. Mignolo's own writing on art is in this category. Uh, in this book, which he's uh, co-authored, um, he says epistemic disobedience is, is ongoing within as well as against existing institutions, including art institutions. Mignolo's review of the Sharjah Biennial, Biennial 11, 2013, proposes that acts of curation and art practice can be decolonial activism. Quote, to make sense of what the Sharjah Biennial entails, we need a decolonial rather than postmodern or postcolonial vocabulary. In starting from the institution of the biennial and brazenly departing from it, Yukio Hasegawa has appropriated the exhibition to dwell in the border. It was a critique of Eurocentrism and a Western centrism of knowledge, which were both embedded, he thought, in earlier exhibitions. The third and last stage in this uh, transformation would be decolonization as interpretive strategy. That's increasingly common in contemporary art history that essays on any number of subjects uh, will use decolonial theory as their interpretive um, mode, especially in North America and Europe, I think. The appearance of the art history questionnaire can also be seen in this way as one of many calls for change in the discipline in different journals that have become contributions to art history's repertoire of analytic tools. So a couple conclusions. I think in deciding what we want to do with the expression decolonizing art history, it helps to consider it historiographically, especially in comparison to other calls to change the discipline that then became strategies used to interpret art. It's not that every call to change the discipline in its institutional and ideological configuration needs to become or necessarily becomes an interpretive strategy. It's that this has happened in the past. It's a tendency of the discipline and it might be something that can be studied historiographically. I think it also helps to look at this expression geographically because decolonizing art history means very different things in North American art practice in the UK and South Africa in 2015 and China and Australia and elsewhere. It's not a single expression that's fixed in its meaning or purpose at the moment and that's one of the things that makes it so interesting.